we're going to look at a bunch of features that might or might not be coming to Star Citizen, which is kind of, you know, all of them. All right, distribution centers are kind of a big deal, but they actually started as these replacements for underground facilities. So this is what my video for this week is actually about. So you'll see this on the upcoming video if you watch it. Check this out. Let's talk about the original underground facilities. Now the problem was we made these originally for the CISNCOM presentation demo and the time we have had wasn't enough to kind of take the location where we wanted it to be. Now, it kind of fits the current purpose. It's fairly small in scale. It gives a, a multi-room layout opportunity for FPS combat, but we always knew we wanted it to be able to scale, you know, small, medium, large to accommodate maybe 60 minutes of gameplay uh, time per location. Sounds familiar, right? So this was, this was a, this was a pretty big reveal in 2022, <laughs> Journey to 4.0, about the upgrades to these UGFs that, like he just said, were made literally for a CitizenCon demo. Yeah, so that's again, moving from that tech demo idea to that game idea. No longer are they using locations that were built for a demo to show off a feature. They're using locations that are built for an actual game to feature all the things that belong to a game. And that's a huge a huge, I think, focus of 323 and of this whole year as a whole. Bees, he, he means the new places are supposed to be 60 minutes, not the old ones. <laughs> yeah, not nah, definitely not the old ones. So here's what those originally were going to look like as of 2022. So how do we go about designing a location archetype from the ground up? So what we do is we split the location into the core areas we want to visually develop. Now for underground facilities, the first thing we're looking at here is what we're calling zone one. So this is the presence on the landscape. So what we're looking at here Spoiler is... alert. And if, if you don't want the spoilers, you should watch the video because it's much better prepared than what I'm giving you now. But spoiler alert, this zone one he's talking about is our distribution centers. Just getting ahead of myself here. They took this concept of, of underground facilities and it, to me, it feels like they split that into three tiers and distribution centers are tier one. I think they're gonna add on to the bottom of distribution centers. They seem to be talking about that. They mentioned it in Star Citizen Live. So what you're going to see here is sort of the future of distribution centers that they gave us uh, before. A, an example kiosk shot of what a medium-sized underground facility could look like. So dominant features that we're seeing here is a, is a, a kind of a key spire. This is instantly where your player, uh, you should be able to navigate towards. This could be like a, a corporate wing or an, exec, an executive landing pad. On you can also hear how um, a lot of people were annoyed by this kind of verbiage he's using here. Uh, but that's Ian's job. My man Ian, is he's all art. He figures these things out and then they fill it with the gameplay, which is where we are now. This could be like a... But you hear him say, this could be, and a lot of people are like, ah, oh, Star Citizen. Bunch of this could be, a bunch of that could be, and... It's kind of the art people's stuff, so. And then moving down, it's very important to be able to get the landing pads or the landing hangars quite close to the facility because we wanted that experience as the player lands. They're not far off from the location. They're actually quite close and you should be able to see um, a little FPS area of, uh, where the player lands. Also, what we're seeing here is some visual justification at what might actually be going on. So you're seeing, you know, um, processing and tanks and supplies actually on the landscape there. Now, what I was saying before about it being a, um, a kind of a, a much braver visual presence on a landscape. So we designed the silhouette primarily. So you'd be able to recognize these um, as a location to aim for. Also, what we're seeing here is we thought it'd be cool to actually have surface entrances as well. So we're actually thinking about primary, secondary, and tertiary ways for the player to get into. Um, these locations depending on the mission scenario. So like I said before, you've got like executive pads at the top, you've got the main hangars in the middle and surface entrances down there below. All right, so then you got these lobbies. Up into the main corporate reception. Now this now, is also gonna... part of what we're getting right now with distribution centers. It's gonna be quite interesting because we'll be able to rebrand these depending on the manufacturer or the location. That's where we'll uh, get a lot of the variety. But this is the, the corporate presence before the play would go down 
into the bowels of the facility. And what we're seeing here is, you know, just an example of what a bearing reception uh, could feel like. All right, so that's zone one. Again, that's that's what we got with distribution centers. Now, I'm just gonna touch briefly on these other zones just to give you an idea of what to look ahead for, but then we're gonna jump to inside Star Citizen with actually one of the guys who was on Star Citizen Live recently talking about these. And he sort of points us towards what I think is the most convincing argument for why distribution centers are still being worked up towards that higher tier of underground facilities. Come on now. So we played around with a few different ideas into this. And one of the things that we thought could be quite interesting is the elevator itself could be a mini play space. So what we're looking at here is control room idea quite early. Uh, what sort of scale vehicles there could be. Now, ultimately, we didn't go with this idea. It, was, um, it didn't really fit the art style that we wanted, um, but it had some pretty interesting ideas. So what we landed on here is uh, something that we felt quite comfortable with. I always say this reminds me so much of um, the first level in Halo 2, when you're going down the elevator on that platform with the Mac cannon firing in the distance and you're fighting those new flying bugs for the first time. This looks so much like that to me. Now it's worth noting, we're designing these as a, a, an archetype first in um, a utilitarian art style. Uh, in the future, we'll uh, expand out and do other art style variants. So what we're seeing here is the control room overlooking the main uh, warehouse floor. And then this elevator is should be big and clear enough for the place i'm on premium that's where logistics will go youtube premium down. so for the it shouldn't be mattering itself, we wanted it to be its own play space so on the top level that's where containers will be shipped up and down but maybe underneath it there could be little uh, nooks and crannies all right next up is the actual underground facility this is the biggest part <laughs> these are the biggest parts of this whole idea of underground facilities so i'm surprised like it's just the distribution centers are small compared to this, you know? So the fact that these are the parts that aren't included yet means that there's a lot to come with these. Owls of the facility. So these are gonna be spaces that we've never really explored before. A lot of the locations in the game tend to be quite residential, but here we're going for something completely industrial. As a player, you wanna feel like uh, an ant almost to the location. The primary purpose is not for you to be walking around. So we dedicated spaces towards logistics and we put kind of personnel walkways almost as a secondary element. So in this image, you're kind of seeing where, you know, big trucks could kind of go, but we've also got like little nooks and crannies for the player to kind of explore uh, and go into. Now, as it being a location dedicated towards the moving of uh, logistics, we wanted to explore and have fun with vehicles, right? So here we're seeing the mule kind of coming and going on one of these walkways. You know, maybe there's elevators. So on the right, what we're seeing is an, uh, a ladder. So with all of these play spaces, as we were having fun and visually exploring, we always kept in mind of different ways for the player to traverse through the scene. Also, as part of that, we wanted to think about verticality. So not just a linear direction of traversal, but also ways in which we could go vertically. So maybe there's uh, the concept of a cargo elevator within the, the corridor. So kind of similar to how you'd see uh, on a character. They go pretty, pretty ham on this too. There's a lot of, of motif. Now, lot of stuff here. Subterranean, uh, we wanted to always um, imply that there's a weight kind of pushing down. So this radial motif is the best load bearing. So uh, as a design language, instantly was feeling quite right. Ward of uh, traversing through the space. So what we're seeing here is uh, a side view to kind of explain how that process. So on the left, we've come in from the corridor. So on the top, we're seeing the primary route through and we're seeing the bottom route coming in as well. So this is how, again, we're gonna try and keep verticality as a traversal motif in mind now going from a large corridor set to all right final part of this is the part that's kind of oh no actually i forgot there's there's even more here um actually no i guess these are the lower sections this is kind of the surprising part of the whole thing this is where the cave systems that they've been developing start to come into play 
idea. We thought these data racks are actually submerged uh, for cooling in uh, a base of water. We thought also it'd be cool if there's a cause and effect. So if the player solves a puzzle to go from it being below water to above water. So again, ways in which we can kind of spark ideas or conversations with design about uh, interesting opportunities. And then lastly, zone four. Now, it wouldn't be, it'd be a missed opportunity if we didn't go into some sort of uh, organic locations as part of the underground facility. So this could be excavation zones or areas where it'd been abandoned. This could lead into cave networks. This was something we had quite a bit of fun with. So how do we actually take the player from being in this fairly well-established industrial location to a cave? There needs to be some form of uh, transition period. So we came up with ideas about how we'd see excavation equipment or, you know, with the roads kind of peter out. And as part of the roads, you know, maybe we can uh, do some pretty cool. Uh, this stuff was getting deep. Not only this was going to be, they, they really want to have, they've actually said it already, distribution centers are supposed to be a center of multiple types of gameplay. So mining, possibly refining, cargo hauling and combat. And this is where the mining would be coming in. Different types of geology, but maybe we're introducing some form of liquid. So depending on the location, maybe it's on a certain planet, there could be like underground rivers, underground lakes, maybe it's lava, maybe it's acidic. And also if we're describing uh, these locations as maybe some are more abandoned, we could start to showcase how nature slowly started to take over. This also would introduce some pretty cool opportunities. So, so also let's go back to the release view now, or actually the, uh, come in here drowning me out. Let's go back to the deliverables and check out underground facilities. Underground facilities had 142 weeks of work starting all the way back in early 2021. Now this doesn't mean it was all this time straight. They could have taken breaks, they could have worked on other stuff, but the amount of time in total that they had at least written down here is 141 weeks ending at the end of last year. That kind of lines up with that switchover they've had from these locations to distribution centers. I don't know if they have those on, they don't have distribution centers on the deliverable view. They just never added them. It's, I don't know, sometimes that just happens. Um, but over time, they updated us a couple more times about this. Check this out. This one is quite telling. Sandbox 2, and we're working on the revamped underground facilities, which you saw at CitizenCon. Come on now. Now, this is the guy who was in Star Citizen Live um, a couple weeks ago talking about distribution centers. So when we're in the stage of very early on in development, it's about kind of iterating quickly, getting into the editor, getting feedback on what we're doing, playing the location as a complete thing as fast as possible. Because only when we see things in context of what they're going to be, can we really make actual um, great decisions on what it is we're making. And this is a collaboration between art and design, mission content, the directors are involved, it's um, just molding the beast into something tangible, which we can then take into our planning stage. The All right, structure jump we... forward. So here's what we were just talking about in the previous episode. You got zone one that he's going over here. This is basically, he's talking about distribution yeah, centers. Need work doing to it or not. Um, they can read it for themselves here. This is great because it gives us a big overview of what's required for the location. And it also means that we can break it down into kind of uh, content packs. So our tier zero is everything that we would need to release this into the universe with some variation. Our, t our tiers after that kind of our additional content, which might flesh out some of the UGS or give it a new theme or that kind of thing. So some of the rooms that are in production at the moment, let's just skip over to them. So this looks like um, one whole thing, it's actually two things. So it's the surface structure, which is this little, this guy in the middle. So you can uh, tell we've gotten this, this. Surrounding or we're getting this. You know, how do you actually get there? 
Um, we've also got our physical elevator spaces. So if we go from the top, this is where you trundle down into the UGF on a lovely diagonal elevator. That's actually the part that hasn't, uh, this is not, this is in the UGF. So if you come forward here, well, this are? is where they kind of lay out all the different tiers. I don't think we're getting a tier zero, honestly. I think this is more a tier one than anything. Um, but it's again, it's only that z that first zone. We're not getting the second, third, or fourth Just zones. How many designers? Um, how but it shows how they're broken artist, up. Uh, how many total days for a sprint? Blah blah blah. Get Adib, all that how done. you doing? And um, that gives us our kind of ballpark figure to 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 go with to begin with. Um, I think I might have to retake this. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. You, you're doing good. Uh, at what point do we ignore Very all? Fast. At what point do we ignore all this? Okay, so it's all great having all of this, and it gives us a really good plan to begin with going forwards. Uh, but as you probably know, game development isn't really a concrete process. You can have all the numbers in the world, but you'll still have things that kind of crop up out of nowhere. That is what game development really is. Like so, my hair. From this point now, we can get back I use the new editor. character customizer. We can start fleshing out these rooms. We can start doing these overlays. We can start finding the variety and, and really bringing these uh, new underground facilities to life. The new underground facilities. All right. Underground facilities, underground facilities, underground facilities. Sandbox they keep going, getting called underground facilities. Revamped. But then we jump forward to Citizen Con of 2023. And um, suddenly we get this. Only in gray box, so just keep that in mind. Sandbox 2, and I'm the product owner for the distribution centers. Before we delve into, oh, I'll put my slide on for a start. Um, before we delve into it, everything that you're going to see is currently in gray box, so just keep that in mind. So, these distribution centers, what are they? Well, first off, they're the biggest location we have on the ground outside of landing zones. The reason why they're so big is intentional. We wanted them to accommodate as much world and mission-based gameplay as possible. Each location supports multiple landing pads and hangars, making them accessible to as many players as possible at any one time. There's even a road network to support transit from the planet's surface, yeah, <laughs> into the main building and to any berth ships. So every distribution center will be owned by a faction, you know, depending on the faction. Right. And the rest of this we, we mostly know, but that's your basic introduction to what the heck these are and why they're here. We are getting this first zone, this first sort of out uh, exterior area along with that interior administration area we saw, as well as like a little extra zone that's not quite that full underground location. It's just more of like a cargo area, but I'll, I'll show you what they've shown us so far here. I'm actually kind of sad to think that a lot of this area is like, while it looks very good and there are AI standing around, I feel like it's going to mostly just be transit area. Um, as big as the scale of these buildings are, it's, it's probably going to be mostly what's inside that matters. They said they're going to run a couple missions outside, but I don't know how much that's going to scale up. At least not anytime particularly soon.
also can't imagine how much of a how crazy these are going to be in the neutral locations where anybody can show up. Thank you. So to talk you through the corporate spaces at these locations, please welcome Rainer Rick to the stage. Hello, hello. So my name is Rainer Rick. All right. And then he talks about a bit of the interior, which we already discussed is kind of like Box another space. location for people to show up for like mission givers and um, other types of, you know, box drop off missions and stuff like that. Keep that in mind. But let's take a look. I believe the, the um, friendly ones will have green zones. And the green zones are temporary. The green zones are only there because the reputation and security system can't back up players yet. But the idea is that there will be no armistice zones. There will be only defenses that the game offers and consequences for things that keep players out of these locations if they're not meant to be there. That can be however successful it might be. The devs can always tune the game as much as they need to if things don't work out, but that's the kind of the goal. As you can see, fun walking gameplay. Absolutely premier salute gameplay. It's the best hallway emergent gameplay you could find. What do I think of 1.0 they're starting to talk about? Um, it's kind of like their base building talk. These are the next things they need to start bringing up as we get closer to them meeting these goals, these long-term goals too. Like five, six years they've been working towards server meshing. So now that it's coming to fruition, they're starting to move on to the next thing. All right, that doesn't really show too much, but you get an idea of what it is. Now, that's distribution centers. We've talked enough about that. Let's talk about a different location that has been getting worked on, but hasn't been touched on for a while. Building interiors. 148 weeks of work ending at about the same time as UGFs means whatever may have happened with these now. You know, we saw what just happened with UGFs. They changed a lot and became distribution centers. Maybe building interiors are completely different from what they are when they introduce us to them. But I'm going to show you what they did introduce us to, and you can kind of pick what you think it might show up being. This is, again, probably a post 4.0 location. This is one of the furthest out locations I think we have actual footage and coverage of so far. Uh, this is very much more of a end game kind of initiative, I think, for them and building out cities and larger locations. And if I could find it, maybe I could show it to you. So don't get super excited about this coming soon, but I do think it's in development still. Yeah, here it is. 4.0 to 4.0. So they call it a journey to 4.0, but I think it's more of a journey to 4.x. This week, Yeah, the ending of the progress tracker doesn't mean anything because it hasn't been updated, but it still shows the work up until that point. So it does mean something. It's not that it doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't mean anything here. But building interiors were scheduled to be worked on as long as UGFs. So that to me says um, they were continuing to being worked on. They were not dropped after this episode. So this is, I'm gonna again do the same thing we did with the UGFs, kind of look at why they're doing this and then we'll jump through the different sections of what it includes. So those interiors, it's something we've always wanted to do. So you know, because of, um, you know, we've had cities in the game for a while. We have many cities, we have many buildings. Therefore, we could have many interiors. It's a perfect opportunity to put in a lot of play space. Now, with the players flying around these buildings, they've been largely urban landscapes, um, fairly uninteractable. You know, we've done a few uh, landing pads to uh, get the players in and out there, but really the the real good stuff was on the inside. So up until now, 
we've been on the outside wondering about the inside and today we're going to talk about the inside looking outside i always love that line i want to be on the inside looking inside still i want the interiors Maybe the progress track will be updated. That'd be uh, nice. All right, so we're building interiors. Um, the way in which we approach the uh, concept development, now this was just a pure uh, blue sky ideation phase. Uh, and the idea was to create uh, inspirational material uh, uh, to use that as a content to inspire, to inspire conversations, to find out what do we want to do for the game? What is cool for the game? And, and use that as the initial springboard for the conversation. So what would be looking- So this is like the exact same sort of thing we saw with UGFs at the very beginning when I told you he was using that language of, oh, this could be, and we would see this here. So what they did last year with this was what they were doing with UGFs the year prior. So imagine that building interiors might be somewhere behind them a year or two years, give or take. So we might be hearing something about this pretty soon, actually. All right, so tell us what parts of building interiors there are, Ian. Oh, uh, right off the bat on the top, it's the rooftop spaces. So these would be the primary access points for the player. Then just below that, uh, the maintenance uh, spaces, these could be industrial or technical. Uh, also, we can have residential. So residential could be entire building blocks, so it could be a proportion. Then after that, we've got commercial. So these could be uh, shopping, it could be offices, it could be social. And then at the bottom, obviously, we've got lobbies. Now, these also could be access points for the player. For example, if you're inside Area 18, the player can get access to it there. And then lastly, we've got the underground. Now, these could be interesting as a connector space between buildings. So maybe you've gone in through one building, you go down, and it could bring you through to another part of a building. Let's start with rooftop. All right. Let's jump it forward just a little Inside bit here. Out. So what we're looking at here is some potential concepts for what could be interesting landing spaces that drives the architecture of the building. With landing pads, it doesn't necessarily mean, need to be on the top of the building. It could be, you know, halfway down or, or lower. So imagine, you know, you're in the lower parts of the city and then we'd open up these additional play spaces. And as you can see here, it's not just the landing pad, it's the gameplay space that goes along with it too. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be a single building. Imagine there is a uh, network hub that services a few different buildings. So what we're looking at here is maybe like a, a transit hub where the player could land, get on some transit, and then that would lead to some buildings. Okay, so maintenance spaces. Uh, so these could be really... Yeah, so, so these are mostly just like engineering style missions that would be around inside. They did a version of this oh. with the Orison platform missions we have now. I think those actually came before this. So that was kind of like they were they're building off that idea for sure. They want to definitely build up more city spaces and urban areas for us to play. I think in terms of player interaction, you know, they could be dealing with the the power or the maintenance of the building, engineering options. And then also you could have technical spaces. So these would be more for technicians. It could deal with the data or the communications. This and would be where hacking at gameplay here would potential happen. Potential some uh, you know gameplay puzzles where the player has to. Uh, worked their way inside the main uh, operation booth. So moving on to residential. So uh, there's a huge amount of p uh, potential here. Okay. One of the biggest possible monetization options for Star Citizen going forward. Freaking residential real estate. Space stations with beautiful views, cities in the center of the galaxy, any kind of thing that would make these things seem cooler in sci-fi books or movies or tv shows that's monetizable like that they can charge extra money for that yeah now i'm not saying they should go all out and start charging money for apartments but i am saying that's an option <laughs> and it's much better than charging money for ships and weapons in my opinion um i you'll be able to earn this stuff obviously in game and you'll be able to you know make work your way up to an apartment i'm just saying that for a game like this where they have to find a way to monetize it and people want to get away from from ship sales i think our apartments are a big big opportunity but this could also just be a really big part of the game in general because of customization because of the social aspects of an mmo because you just want to have a place where you can keep all your stuff on each planet um i like the potential of this what we wanted to do with residential is two things one explore 
um, investigating the potential player housing. So with that, we want to be able to create a variety of interior layouts. Lovely hair. I know. And also we want to explore a variety of architectural styles. So when we're looking at uh, potential uh, housing layouts, we wanted something fairly modular in a way in which we could create a variety of combinations. So whether it's living spaces or habitation spaces or social spaces. And also here we're looking at, we want the place to eventually be able to populate. Thank you, Firefly. Uh, uh, player own habitations Appreciate that you see you. here, like a first indication of how, you know, the sort of dressing styles that you'd be able to do. Outside of something that's trying to live in like that dark, dungy cyberpunk apartment versus these super high quality, like luxury spots. Fairly high end. So here we're just exploring some ideas about this one gives me oblivion vibes. That movie from with uh, Tom Cruise. What a space Tony. could feel like on a different architectural style and more generous windows, you know, uh, interior space is dedicated to more than just uh, uh, habitation. And these would be focused on other landing. All right. And then you've got like commercial stuff, work, cubicle it folks. It means we can look at areas that are more gameplay focused uh, outside of player habitation. So when we're talking about these, these could be office blocks. These could be corporate owned um, inside here. There could be corporate wings. There could be manufacturing. There could be office spaces. And what we try to think about with these, it's more than just a flat room. There should be advanced reversal it should be multi-tiered so outside of the commercial office as um as marcus said there's going to be a lot of wasted space in these in these areas these areas are going to be mostly walking space right but there's a lot of atmosphere and and world building that goes into this that i think will be important yeah. these are going to be access points to the player but also we can do more than just uh, a standard uh, foyer that we're seeing in the game right now so this sort of space we're seeing here is imagine yeah, there's an underground right transit network and that transit station feeds a network of building uh, lobbies. So these could be uh, social spaces. These could be really good combat spaces. Uh, they could have access to many restaurants or bars or facilities. And we're just showing that in a variety of art styles. So one's a fairly low end. One could be fairly high end, but the, the infrastructure is the same. So, and then my favorite part, the underground. It means we can access a whole area of play space that uh, doesn't need to be contained inside the building. So within a lobby, um, we want the player to start to traverse down into these spaces. And these could be underground uh, transit networks. They could be abandoned underground transit networks. This then could drive potential racing opportunities. So when we was doing this, we thought, oh, it'd be really cool. Like, what would it look like if there's an underground street race going on there? Also, yes, there could please. be traversal opportunities. <laughs> like See, this is like, what if this could connect to caves? What if this could connect to the underground facilities we were just talking about? Like, how much scalability is this if these locations show up next to each other? How far could they really go with this two, four, eight, 15 years down the line? I mean, I know that's insane. All right, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say this is something that shouldn't be here for 15 years, but like, I'm pretty sure RuneScape just celebrated 20 years. World of Warcraft is on on track for that Eve. Um, Star Wars Galaxies, if it didn't get killed, would still be around. There's tons of games that are going to last 20 years, especially now. People are actually building games to last that long. You don't think Fortnite's going to be around 20 years? Yeah, it might not. I don't know. But like, the idea of this getting updates 15 years from now doesn't, blow my mind or doesn't like it's not a surprise to me so i do wonder how this cuff how this stuff could be utilized that long from now like i said before if the player wanted to go into one building down and then through and then up into another building what would that traversal network be like especially if we're thinking about if it's an older part of the underground of a city maybe it's uh, less used, you know, people have built up, um, that would uh, instantly inspire a whole bunch of traversal and uh, investigation missions there. Or maybe there's an old aqua. All right. Today, honestly, has been, I, I was going to go over features, but today feels mainly like a locations update. So I'm going to keep with the trend. Let's talk about space stations. Space stations are another, we're kind of going through all the archetypes of, of, oh, I guess that is a pretty good idea for what this could be. 
a look at every archetype in Star Citizen. We touched on underground facilities. We just look at bunkers. Let's look at space stations. They're a bit rough. Not gonna lie. Space stations are a little bit disappointing in Star Citizen right now, but they have some decent plans for them. We've seen what they've been doing with Pyro. I'm not gonna go all the way back to like the things they've said about space stations way back in the day, um, but they have a lot of plans for the branding and the way that people understand space stations through scale oh. and through design. And you can go all the way back to this panel, Star Citizen, Citizen Con 2021, where they kind of started to introduce this new form of what they wanted from space stations. Here is our introduction to this new idea for space stations. Now, this isn't for everything. This is mainly for Pyro, but I think it does still lend some credence to the direction they're going and how extreme they want so to make everything look at sort of points. branded. They've evolved quite a bit since last time you saw them. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Jake. Uh, so one of the things that players will first probably come across when they come into the Pyro system is the space station. You know, it was discovered a long time ago. It was sort of deemed uninhabitable because it was just too dangerous with that that variable flare star going on. Uh, so they kind of utilized the system for resources. And then when they kind of tapped out, they just sort of left. And that's when all the sort of squatters came in. So there's sort of older infrastructure built to sustain kind of the mining activities and the gas harvesting and stuff like that. But, you know, they, they just basically left and then other populations start to slowly move into the system, criminals, squatters, survivors, and whatever, and, and start to kind of take over what was left behind. Which gives us some unique gameplay comparatively um, to Stanton and the, the space stations there. So with Pyro, since they're in such disrepair, some of them are inhabited, some of them are completely abandoned. And then she took my hair. So the players can go and explore, they can go and see it's hot in here what, my what's hair is happened hot. there. Um, whether it's been hit by an asteroid, um, or if it's uh, there was some sort of conflict there before, but you'll be able to go and explore the different decks. Um, Yo, Abdi, much love to you, dude. Hope you're having a good day. Be able to uh, go and meet new people, meet the frontier lifestyle. Enjoy it. Okay, so before we go to the insides of the stations, we're going to jump now to Eric, and he's going to go in a bit more detail, the concept development process taken when looking at the exteriors. Hi, I'm Eric Gagnon, principal concept artist on Star Citizen. The goal of that initial step of sketch development is to create something not invited. Dangerous, damaged by asteroids and surrounded by floating debris. Hiding place for Atla looks old, decrepit. Lawless, no security force here. Approach at your own risk. Industrial look, messy, but not abandoned. Some parts are wrecked, but under repair and relocate. I like to use the black and white sketches to start. It's, it allows us to go very quickly and focus on the shape only. We then try to play with a touch of color to define more of the commercial port platform. We try different schemes to remind us of the whole look with a rusty vibe and brown tones. Adding a touch of light and some context around the sketch allows to see the scale of thing and properly view the silhouette. We expand on the ID to All play right, with the let me Hold on, let me step forward to more of the function of this because there's actually some really interesting stuff they talk about here. Concept phase. The design stuff is good. And again, I think it does say a lot about the direction they're going, especially because we're gonna, we're gonna touch on other types of stations. They're really talking about outlaw stations here, but we're gonna have service stations that are just for refueling. We're gonna have stations that are just meant for like little shops and parts. We're gonna have stations that are supposed to be full on malls. The way that we have uh, stations right now is kind of the way that UGFs are. They're just there to be there. They were there for, made for a specific thing, and they have a whole system of these things that they're going to replace them with. Again, we'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, some of the previous stuff from CitizenCon last year will go into that. Right now, we're going to go from the outside, and we're going to uh, jump to the interior. Before we really started exploring anything, 
one of the core concepts uh, that was discussing as a group was the idea of power and the idea of heat. Now, we've got like this big interior layer of this, maybe this old mining station. How, how would they have adapted the space? You know, they would have, right, okay, we need power here. Okay, that will create heat. So we started thinking about, okay, where would the heat lamps be? And then be, where would light come from? So just the, the principal concept of power creating heat, creating light, that was pretty much the, the core of the start of the visual development process. So when we started talking about it from a design side, we needed to make sure that we were covering certain shops, uh, just basic needs for. Hi, my name is Christian Doritz. Uh, I'm a senior concept artist uh, on the environment team. And uh, we're gonna look at the concept development for the space station a little bit. So first off, we looked at the heat map. So there is a lot of, um, what I said, the electricity is gone, the, the heating is gone, and the breathable air, the oxygen is gone. So um, there is pretty much all of those connected areas, they are, um, they are lifeless in, in a way, right? So you wouldn't settle down somewhere in between those. Uh, um. That's exploration, by the way. People talk about us not having exploration opportunities because everybody searched everything. But these space stations can keep respawning stuff. Um, NPCs, maybe non-human NPCs, loot, treasures, little missions, things that you can do to go off into these cold distances and like turn power back on. We're actually going to look at abandoned space stations in a few minutes here and you'll see that there's a lot of opportunities for not just some combat engagements, but like restarting power and getting things booted back up to maybe get some special reward. And these space stations can be scattered everywhere in a star system. Stanton is tiny. It's like three or four AU wide, and we got systems that are 20 to 120 AU wide in this game. So there's a lot more places to hide space stations and things in places where most people aren't going anyways. Maybe we screen those empty corridors. We were trying to uh, sort our thoughts and get them on paper, right? So we were exploring different ideas that we on the concept team had in mind. Uh, so we were thinking about pathways um, that the player and the NPC could take. So what would happen, we were thinking about what would happen if all of a sudden one pathway is blocked off or um, another one will open up, right? So we were thinking about verticality and um, how the players and the NPCs can traverse all of those um, interesting areas that are in the end pretty uh, ominous, right? So think about there are some people just a lot of screwing space. off side panels on the wall or they are uh, screw, uh, screwing off um, ceiling panels and you would see all of the maintenance areas behind it. So, so we'd see a lot of struts, a lot of working areas, there's cables hanging. So. Um, those were the very first sketches where we could uh, see what those eventually could evolve into. And um, we also started then slowly. I believe with this some, might uh, be loose, one of those uh, one of the guys sketches. that came over from Ubisoft when uh, CIG started to use more Montreal talent. So getting everything into 3D, and it's pretty much evolved over time where we could talk to the environment guys, and we were asking for some of the current rest stops, uh, uh, geo, and some of the textures, and uh, then getting them. Uh, um, into 3D and we were just changing up all of the props, all of the side panels or all of the, the whole uh, um, the environment. So we could, looking back at the references, then convey this feeling. We could introduce more dirt, we could introduce uh, some damaged panels, side panels, and pretty much explore this uh, side area, right? What and I am gonna need is an explanation for why the Pyro space stations would look anything like the Stanton space stations, because I think their discovery and settling is like three to 400 years difference. Maybe they're using the exact same space stations, but you know, give me something to work with, come on. The, the big advantage of this is that we can you know, make the, the environment how we like. So one thing that we did is like kill all the lights uh, because we don't need lighting. We wanna, we wanna create our own lighting. And this is what, what I said earlier. Um, the current rest stops are super bright. They are, uh, they are family friendly, but now we wanna make it ominous. We wanna make it dark mood. We wanna make it super dark with the players like always feeling kind of in danger and especially with the gang members in mind, right? So this would allow us to create one of, uh, uh, one of the very early, or uh, one of the, the um, earlier um, 3D explorations, which then lead to one of the final uh, concept arts or the, um, the final implementation of this. So when we were at the point where we were kind of um, 
okay or where we thought like okay this is this is an environment uh, that we want to see then we took care about the last 20 percent so the last 20 percent in this case means having a final render and uh, painting over so we were just um, painting over in Photoshop and doing some uh, some more refined uh, refinements for the mood and the lighting. We were painting in some uh, some of the decaling and some of the graffitis because it is ultimately easier to do all these things in uh, 2D than in 3D and caring about the. They were actually showing this off in the engine too. You could see um, modeling in Blender there instead of Rastar. They use Houdini, I believe, in conjunction with Mighty Bridge to do their space station stuff. They might also do that with Blender. Many instances we start to get a little bit of ice coming through as well. So that means once it's all fallen down here, it's actually quite wet and damp. Uh, for It's still cold and a little bit warm around heaters, but it's generally quite damp because of that weird kind of event. Now the rain as it currently sits is just a placeholder asset that we're borrowing from Squadron and that will have to obviously be remade to suit the amount of rain that we want to have within this environment which won't be you know crazy <laughs> but um, it serves as a proof of, proof of concept for what we're trying to achieve right. So that is pretty much Pyro Stations. Um, I hope you really enjoyed like seeing the breakdown that we've done here today, um, seeing, uh, learning a little bit about the process of going in and doing a visual target and, um, you know, just a little bit more of that earlier process and problem solving that we go through. So yeah, I hope you really enjoyed the rest of CitizenCon here today and uh, I'll catch you later. Cool, thanks All Josh. Right. So that's space stations as we were hearing about them, what was that, 2021? Here is a jump forward to 2023 and a look at what they're doing with space stations now and how they're going to change our interactions with them. Archetypes and gameplay to support new and interesting experiences. Aside from the social aspects, there is gameplay and exploration on the location. Sorry, that was loud. I've hoped you had a chance to play the demo over the past couple of days. I know I've spoken to a few of you. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. It was a sneak peek of our current progress. Let's kick off with an overview of the Pyro system. For the Pyro system release, we plan on six... All right, we don't need to go over all of Pyro. Let's go to specifically space stations. Here we go. Oh, your first Citizen Con in 21. Nice. That was a... That's a good one to start on. That one felt properly restrained, although it was still a little... Obviously, showed... No, 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 I'm sorry. That was the road to 4.01. A little rough. 22 was much better. So they really stuck with this theme of concentrated heat and kind of abandoned corridors. Central areas are, are pretty heavily populated, though. Verticality, here's some engineering gameplay options. Thank you. So to create a richer experience from rundown stations, we have three key points. So increased reputation gives you access to new areas, unique gear, and mission givers. It's also, it also relates to basic functions such as the halved clinics, which need at least a neutral standing with their owners. Combat can take place anywhere, including social areas. Numerous options for environment traversal and enhanced environmental interactions. We aim to include new substation areas such as the workers area, lower deck, and maintenance areas more environment interactivity and interconnection between areas. Our journey begins when the player arrives in the entry deck view room. The entry deck serves as the first barrier between the outside world and the interior of the station. Some inhabitants are prevented from going inside and are stuck here with no means of getting out. Slums are formed beneath the bridge, smuggling routes established. Some shopkeepers will sell you water and food on your way into and out of the station. Let's have a look.
The alternative traversal stuff is pretty nice. I actually didn't see this when I was playing this part. Areas are a lot more gamified. Let's see if I can update this quality so we can see a little bit better. Come on, work with me. Giveaway is still going, by the way, guys. Mustang Alpha game package. If you or your friend is looking to get into Star Citizen, exclamation point giveaway will make the link pop up. Get entered. It's not, not, not too long. Just a thank you for everybody helping us get back on our feet. Honestly, these space stations, by the way, like they're talking about verticality and stuff. These stations have more space on them than landing zones. From my small amount of time playing in Pyro, the newer space stations feel like landing zones themselves. And I know Ruin Station is supposed to be a landing zone, but even these other ones were just very expansive. How are Echo and Frenchie doing? I'm sure quite lovely. Echo's in here, enjoying his cotton candy milk, I believe. So Khan touched on reputation earlier. Let's see how that is applied to the stations. So how does the reputation gate in the entry deck affect gameplay? What happens if we have good reputation? So if you had good re reputation, you could go straight through. This is no fuss, and it's the quickest way to maneuver through the station. This is good to remember when it comes to distribution centers. So what we're getting with distribution centers is equivalent to what we're getting with space stations and Stanton. But at some point, both distribution centers or whatever they turn into and space stations will turn into what he's about to talk to here, which is a system that's basically entirely controlled by reputation and allows you to go places or not go places depending on who you work for or against. What happens if you neutral reputation? So you might be waved through, maybe you have to pay a bribe and you don't want to pay, so you can have to find an alternate pathing. Or you can have to build up your reputation. If you have bad reputation, and for all you naughty ones out there, I know some of you exist, this applies to you. In short, you can have a tough time, but you have options. So stealth via other pathways might be one of those options. You build your reputation up from scratch, or you could probably fight. Let's focus on those alternate pathways. Yum, 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 yum. The modules in the station are broken up into Good rep with the faction. Areas. As with the other location archetypes, we define these spaces as secondary or tertiary routes, as opposed to the more official primary paths. Most modules are interconnected with vents and maintenance shafts. These reward the players with infiltration and exploration paths, as well as potential loot. So what alternative routes exist to enter this, access the station? We'll offer the opportunity to access the station through multiple EVA points on the exterior. Yo, this if is... I am surprised to see this. I don't think I could pull it up. It's a pretty old clip where they showed this off. Maybe I have it in my files, but I really doubt that. In fact, I don't think I have my files locally on this machine. They're all on my other machine. This, there was a very, very, very old um, around the verse. We looked at it recently, I think. I don't remember when. And they showed the progress that they were making on these. Oh, I feel like I could probably find it. I don't know what episode it's going to be on. I don't think we would be able to find it. But there were some EVA access hatches they were making for space stations years and years ago. Pretty cool to see it coming back here. Anyways, enough of that distraction. Gives you the choice on how to tackle missions and reputation issues. These alternative entries allow the player to circumvent the ATC loop completely. Useful for when your reputation with the owners would normally prevent you from going through more official ways. These so this is equivalent to those underground sneak-ins they talked about with building interiors. They're setting these up for all the archetypes. The spaces that provide content aligned or against aligned or against the owners of the station. 
The maintenance hatch access points are a new common sublocation to the stations. The stations are planned to house maintenance areas that increase the interconnection between all the different sub areas of the station. They act as alternative pathways the player can take to traverse from the entrance area to the Galleria, for example. Now let's have a look at our main social space. The market. A central location for the controlling faction, it houses all their nefarious activities. You can participate in their endeavors if you have the right rep. Let's have a look at some of those key features. Echo, how are you letting work get in the way of your space obsession? Who wants some f***ing noodles? Yeah, these locations are gonna feel a lot better than what we have right now, but they, the AI's gotta match. Everything feels dead and dumb when the AI is so derpy, but when they're actually doing things in those locations, it's gonna feel very alive. So here again is your engineering gameplay, not just in ships, it's gonna be in these space stations. They keep on alluding to it very, very strongly, and people should know. Um, these are going to be probably some of the more in-depth missions that we get at these locations. Work is also your space obsession. That is fair, Echo. You got it made that way. Do the noodle dance, dude. What a throwback. Thank you. So the market is a social hub and a good example of mixing social and gameplay space, as mentioned by Khan earlier. Another reputation gate can be found in the market. The ground floor is open to the common public. The upper floor is reserved to rough and ready outlaws and their associates. If you have increased reputation, you can access the area. You can access this area, which gives you access to premium items, top tier mission givers and access to new areas. We plan to house mission givers in both tiers that will give you unique jobs to further your reputation and fame across pirates. I think they need to talk about mission givers again soon because it's been, it's been years since we've heard about them. I'm betting that their idea of what a mission giver is does not match what we think it is anymore. Right. Now let's have a look at another theme. Abandoned is a new non-social location theme. Let's have a quick look at the current abandoned area on Checkmate. Okay. This is what I was talking about with abandoned space stations. This is, I think, the big wild card when it comes to space stations, because this offers us tons and tons of scale, uh, exploration opportunities, all kinds of discoveries and aliens and different types of things they could do here. Um, this was on the roadmap a long time ago, for those who remember. I think it was like 2019 or 2018. Derelict space stations were on the roadmap briefly, but were moved, and now they're finally seeing a comeback in a pretty cool way. So we have entire abandoned stations as separate locations. On top of that, there are abandoned areas within the rundown stations, much like the ones you probably see in the demo. There will be around 15 of these around the pyro system. These are accessible through airlocks and breaches or other means. We aim to enhance all the space locations with a lot more gameplay content. Interestingly, if you go back to the beginning, he says, there's going to be, what, 26 space stations in total? That's too difficult. Jump point stations that connect for Stanton and future systems such as Magnus. Rest stop stations are either in rundown or abandoned states. Okay. 
So he's saying there are 15 abandoned or run down stations, I think, or 15 abandoned stations. I'm not sure, but 15 of the 26 might be abandoned, which means only 11 could be offering actual services. So when you hear them say that there are 26 space stations, remember, some of those space stations aren't actually doing anything for you. They just offer more game space. It's basically just taking space and making it game. Game space. All right, I don't think this is going to load the rest of the way for us, but we kind of touched completely on space stations. The last archetype of location for us to look at, could have just stayed in that same video for it, are towns or outposts. I don't really know what to call them anymore. They're two different things because on one hand, outposts are like a couple of buildings that you might find somewhere off in a planet. But on the other hand, six outposts together make a town so it seems like they're they're sort of melding this group but they started it out as outposts uh, that we know in stanton and then we even saw the colonialism outposts coming along for a few years and now they're really bringing this up to scale with the rest of star citizen and they're introducing what seem to be full-on towns that people can visit that are supposed to mimic like cities and distribution centers and uh Space stations. So here's that sort of fourth archetype we've got. Eddie, I'm an assistant art director on Star Citizen for locations. Um, before we start, I'd like to mention that all of the footage we're about to see comes from our current stable builds. So all of that beautiful tech, all of those features that we've seen in the last two days is coming from our tech development builds. Now, all those features are going to make their way to you, of course, eventually. Uh, but that is the reason you're not going to see some of them in the bills today. I just wanted to get ahead of the comments a little bit there. Um, so with that said, what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm really excited to show you that the heart of the hard work that um, the Sandbox One team have been doing to expand our new outpost locations. I'm going to start by going over how we've expanded the library and what that means we can now achieve with the new locations and then how we achieve that variety from the library by categorizing our locations into both archetypes and themes, and what that means for you as a player. So I don't know if you remember this, but at Sitcom in 2021, uh, we showed this new style of outpost for the first time. Now, at this point, we had our art style locked in. Um, we'd worked on our library of content to the point where we could make smaller locations like this one, but with a limited amount of variety between each one. And this is what that library of modules looked like at that point. Um, we'd established our main building modules as well as some of our larger buildings and a number of smaller secondary and dressing and standalone modules. But each outpost couldn't be too large without there being some obvious repetition between the modules used. So let's have a look at that library today. That's a sir. <laughs> so that's this is part of their whole we're gonna build out a bunch of systems because all this time they've been working on the tool to place this stuff in the game. Now they're finally starting to build these gigantic libraries of assets and you can see how they can start to mix and match them. Yeah, you're going to notice some copy and paste. That's inevitable. It's going to happen. There's, it's not an unlimited amount of assets they can make, but the combinations they can make with this stuff are looking pretty good and, you know, throw on different factions and themes like abandoned or pirate based or more corporate based and then also the fact that this is more outlaw focused colonialism but you've also got utilitarian high tech postmodern henoistic styles of these outposts so there's plenty of variety that'll be but for now it's it is probably going to be a little bit repeaty so in order to achieve that greater visual and design delta between each outpost and have them not feel like exact clones of one another, we've massively expanded our module library in terms of breadth and depth. And what I mean that, we, we go broad by making more modules with different purposes, and we go deep by creating multiple thematic overlays for each of those modules as well. And I'll, go into that, I'll go into what that means a little bit in a minute. But the challenge of a sandbox location like this, as you can see, it's not about building a single unique location. That can be quite straightforward, to be fair. It's about giving our artists and designers the building blocks, the, the affordance to build multiple locations that all feel somewhat different, even if they do share that same basic DNA. So it's about creating both the ingredients at the same time as the recipes and making sure all of those flavors work in harmony with one another for both visuals and gameplay. 
So every individual part has to take into consideration all of those design philosophies. So every single module has to take into consideration those design philosophies that Carl mentioned. But we also have to make sure that they work with those same principles when an artist or a designer combines them into any one of a number of different layouts. So the more ingredients we have to work with, the more recipes we can create. But with that complexity comes the challenge of keeping everything harmonious. So we like to think we've done a pretty good job with that. But that's me. This is the um, part where they kind of turned it from outposts into towns. This expanded library, we've been able to increase the individual location size because there's less of that obvious repetition between buildings within any single location. And we can't really call some of these large locations outposts anymore. They become something more like settlements and imply a larger and more established community. Now, as a player, it will mean a lot more to explore and do at any single individual location with a localized and personal feeling mission types that might see you moving around a single settlement to complete objectives. Or do That's also something that they've been talking about with distribution centers, personal, uh, localized gameplay. Again, something they also introduced with these new space stations that we saw in the pyro demo, localized missions that take place in that one location. All of these location updates are including the same things across different mediums and um, it's becoming pretty clear they're all kind of in line with each other. The mission types that might see you moving around a single settlement to complete objectives or doing short hop missions between clusters of settlements on a single planet. So you might head up to a ridge to repair some wind turbines. You could counter an outlaw attack from a neighboring outpost or on the opposite side you might be stealing or destroying vehicles for the criminal gang that you're working for. But in the art department, we always say show, don't tell. So let's stop looking at slides and let's have a look at some of the locations in game. See, that's cool. The fact that they have these locations and they have, they're not way out here, but you can see there's like a clear maybe a kilometer distance between the two. So you could have delivery missions in between the two or some kind of interesting objectives that require you to drive across rather than fly. Shadow of Mordor vibes. Thank you. All right, this part's actually pretty important, so we'll listen to this too. So, what flavors of Outpost did we just see there? Well, we categorize them in two different ways, as I said, and then we mix and match those categories together to provide that variation. Now, the first and primary category is the archetype, and they provide that core gameplay hook and define the main function of a settlement. So scrapyards have a landing pit module for repairs and refueling. Mining operations can have a refinery module and ore extractors for resource and commodity trading. And trading posts themselves allow a broader range of item purchases through the dedicated trade building module. And I mentioned earlier some more like general mission types that you might find that would be agnostic of archetype. And the archetypes themselves reflect that primary gameplay function of a settlement, but there's also a middle layer. Of course, we don't want these locations to just be a glorified shop or repair station. So there's going to be more secondary activities to do locally to an outpost that are also defined by its archetype. So you may find scrapyards can offer salvage-related gameplay and missions. Trading posts can also deliver offer delivery missions or hauling and cargo gameplay, and farms can offer crops and fauna as resources for gathering or trading. So 
With archetypes as a primary category, in addition, we mix in a secondary category, and these are the thematic overlays. Now, at the moment, we have two main themes. Internally, we call these independent and outlaw. So themes offer additional variation on top of the archetypes to inform the look and feel of a location, not just visually, but which people you'll interact with there, how they'll respond to you based on your rep, what types of missions you'll have available to take on. So themes don't change the fundamental architecture of a space or the archetype of a location, but they do drastically alter the mood and feel, as well as altering the gameplay experience significantly. Uh, and again, let's take a look at the first of our themes, our independent theme. Sig! You didn't get the Senbei notification, dude? Yeah, these look, these look so much better. Hold on. Let's just get a quick early update on what these looked like when they first introduced them to us. It was around that same time when they first introduced those space stations to us. A lot of this stuff, guys, is it correlates to each other. They had a lot of these things kind of start up in earnest in 2020 and 21. And they're really coming, coming around now in 24 uh, altogether. Not altogether, but a lot of them. But this large, beautiful, you know, archway here kind of signifies, you know, the main entrance, the primary entrance to the, the main social module. I think the air looks look great. You know, fits in with the art style beautifully. The team did a great job on this. And then uh, we've seen the concept art previously in the day, and then, you know, here you can see it translated uh, in game, I think it absolutely looks fantastic. You know, uh, the radial forms, you know, is, is quite uh, quite special to this art style. Uh, All right. You can see the, how that so that's what it looked like back then. But you can see they've gotten a little denser, a little more detailed since then. A lot more props and things hanging around to make it seem more full, appealing to the eyes. Think the lighting is way better? Don't apologize cool. to me. Thank you. So as a neutral player, the independent theme presents a much more social, visual, and gameplay experience. Um, the primary visual read across both themes, E1 giveaway. so right. across both Outlaw and Independent, comes from those common architectural forms, and they're generally all more rounded and soft in shape, and the building manufactured techniques are more robust. Again, remember what he's talking about this. This is just the colonialism outpost style. I can't wait to see what happens when they do this whole settlement thing for utilitarian outposts. That'd be cool. The building manufactured techniques are more robust and primitive with single-story single dwellings built from stucco and bare metal. Stucco. But for this theme specifically, we use soft textiles, warm lighting and color palettes, foliage, decoration, that layer on top of those utilitarian structures to give that sense of home. And I use the word home for our independent theme quite a lot because we really want to get that feeling that this is home for the people that live there despite those harsh realities of frontier life. And in contrast to that, we have a theme that lies in a direct opposition to the independence, which we call the outlaw theme. So let's take a look at that now as well. Yeah. Yo, Plywood, you've been getting a lot of use out of the socks. Really nice and hold up after many washes. Thank you. We put a lot of work into the design of those and uh, picking the company that made them. Glad you've been enjoying them, dude. Keep your toes warm with our custom tomato socks if you want to help support us, folks. 
exclamation point toes I believe by the way if you didn't catch it what they're showing off here is the same outposts with a different uh, theme overlaid this is the outlaw theme instead of the uh, neutral theme I think so just kind of showing how much they can start to change the vibe and atmosphere of these places with just the cosmetics I thought it was toes is it not socks That never ends well. So the outlaw theme tells that story of these once functional settlements being completely overrun by the various criminal elements that inhabit the system. And visually, we have themes of a regressed and subverted civilization. So we layer on top of the architecture these spiked and aggressive forms and we have aggressive spikes. Of squalid living arrangements and light fire. comes from fires or oh my God. <laughs> maintained fixtures. Some spaces are going to be recognizable as deformed versions of the uh, Jay, thank you for the sub. Appreciate you. Two months. I hope you're enjoying the streams. Dependent theme, but some have been completely changed to more uh, nefarious purposes. Um, and while both themes employ all of the various alternative pathing and traversal considerations that Khan detail, detailed just earlier, um, the outlaw spaces are weighted more towards combat. But just because these spaces are more dangerous and the experience can be more combative, that doesn't mean that the archetype of the outpost is lost. So if you as a player choose to be a criminal working up your rep with a headhunter gang, you'd be welcome at the trading posts and you'd be able to buy and sell items or take on missions but you probably won't then be very welcome at the independent-themed locations, and that's where you'd get your combat experiences. So while the outlaw theme looks very different, the functionality of those archetypes still remain. And again, so reputation. I've talked about the kinds of outposts we've been hard at work on, and I hope you've enjoyed checking them out over the last two days uh, in the Pyro demo. It's really made me very pleased to see people playing our content at last, so thank you for that. Uh, but where are we heading from here? Well. I hope it should be obvious that we're going to get these out for the first Pyro release. Uh, we still have some final optimization and polish passes to do across the whole library. And then we're also going to be expanding the amount of these locations throughout Pyro and beyond. And our tools allow us to do that very quickly now. And we've got the library as well to do it. And the new outposts are not limited to the Pyro system. They're completely um, system agnostic. So you can expect to see these outposts in other systems as well. And of course, we're going to look to add more ingredients, more of those modules to the library as well to further expand the variety and depth that you'll be able to see at these new locations. We want to encourage more on-foot gameplay within a small ecosystem of a planet. Yes, please. That more localized and personal feeling experience. That's something we need. We need that so much more. I'm glad that they're saying that with basically all of these locations now. Yes. Our goal with these locations, as with many of the others we're going to hear about today, is to continue to work on the gameplay so that every location offers a rich playground to explore. And I guess I'd like to finish just by thanking everyone for listening today. It's really great to see you all. And I'm going to pass you over to Nick, who's going to talk about some locations that are coming in the nearer future. Thank you. And those locations are basically the derelict settlements that are kind of like taking the Stanton version of what we just saw for Pyro, but these aren't necessarily the full-on settlements like those colonialism outposts. These are more actual derelicts. They're made of trash and stuff, so they're not as significant a location, and I think something that'll fit in 
not necessarily where these settlements that we just looked at would fit in, but they're still adding to the ground locations. But I think we can include these in the, the outpost archetype that we just looked Let at. Let me present you the new derelict settlement. good music. <laughs> I just, oh, okay, I'm back. That's really strange. I just lost all audio for a second. Uh, and then it came back much louder. Again, this is, oh my gosh, this is what happens when you use a computer you don't usually use. You guys all hear me, right? We're all good? I'm assuming since you said us too, you heard that happen. Looks like we're all back though. That was weird. Let me make sure I'm not too loud now. All right, finally, the... This location's actually already in the game. A lot of these locations are already in the game. Yeah, I'm a bit louder now. Not sure why that... Here we go. I think it just reset my whole GoXLR. And here's just a look at like some of the missions and stuff we'll be getting here. Again, these locations are already in the game, so this isn't necessarily upcoming. This is just more of a look at what is happening to settlements. If it, if it runs. Oh, man. Can't wait till my game runs this smooth. I really do hope that this new PC runs the game well. See if this if this includes I really could just do a box mission. Like if it's just a go to this outpost and pick this up kind of thing and there's enough stuff at that outpost to interest things like shopping opportunities, maybe other NPCs to, ca to run into and get like a little task from. Maybe even a little bit of loot or something to, to visit nearby the outpost. All those things would be enough for me to be like, yeah, I'll run a cargo box mission because I know I'll get more out of it than just flying to a place and getting a box. But a lot of those extra things need to be built into the game using some of these systems like engineering and reputation. And the AI, yeah, Christian. Because look at him even here. 
They're just standing there. This is what we know of AI. That networking system really needs to come in and help us out here. <laughs> nice bounce. So that's settlements. And that really kind of answers, I think, the biggest question of like, why are we getting towns and settlements? Why are we getting these very distinct new types of locations? And it's because of the same reason we're getting everything else that's going on with the game right now. Um... There's a lot shifting to make it more game-like, to make it more of something that people can play long-term and not just test features out. And these locations, all of them are being prepared in very similar ways. Reputation, um, danger levels, archetypes, themes, localized gameplay, and the ability to link into some of these other missions we're doing. It's, mm, it's feeling good, guys. Locations have been doing great ever since Montreal jumped in. But now all the gameplay is kind of starting to catch up, so I think we're going to have some really interesting stuff to get involved with towards the end of the year. This started out as a review of upcoming features, and I'm sorry, but we got distracted. It ended up becoming basically just a look at locations and how they're changing, and I think it was actually a pretty good little deep dive kind of mini walkthrough, because um, the way these locations are changing is going to change how we play.